Hello, this is Tia Christensen, and welcome to Energy Empowerment Masterclass, Top Tools for Women in Power to Double Their Energy for Clarity, Peak Performance, and Optimum Health. Today, I am very excited to be talking with Dr. Carrie Drizga, and she is known internationally as the functional medicine doctor. She is the go-to person for the root cause of your health problems so that you can feel better. Dr. Carey holds two degrees, chiropractic and natural medicine, naturopathic medicine, and has some additional training in functional medicine, which I'm going to read off my notes here so I don't forget anything. Um, and that is uh, the Bredston Recode program. We also have uh, additional training in bioidentical hormones, acupuncture, the Kalish method, and a certified gluten practitioner. Dr. Carey is also the host of the very popular The Functional Medicine radio show, as well as author of the hit book, which I have right here, so hopefully you can also reclaim, um, <clears throat> excuse me, reclaim your energy and feel normal again. Dr. Carey also has a practice, the functional, functional medicine in Ontario, in Ottawa, Ontario. So uh, thank you, Dr. Carey, for joining. We had, we had some technical difficulties, so, um, so I appreciate your patience, but here we are. We're ready to go. Here we, technical difficulties happen in life, and we just have to plow through them. That's right. Well, um, I, we'll go ahead and dig right in. I, am, I would love to know... What led you to becoming a functional medicine doctor? Because I know that you had these other practices before. And what led you to create this movement around reclaiming our energy and helping people with fatigue? And how does that align with energy empowerment? So that's a great question and one that I often get asked. So early on in my chiropractic career, um, as a doctor, what would frustrate me most about being in practice would be those patients that did not get better. And so I just had this natural curiosity as to, well, why aren't patients getting better? You know, a certain amount were, like 80% of patients were getting better, but the 20% that are not getting better, why is that? And that would frustrate the heck out of me. And so I just started learning more, searching out answers, looking for solutions, and I stumbled across functional medicine and when I learned what functional medicine is, so for your listeners out there and your uh, viewers, in a nutshell, functional medicine is find the cause, fix the cause, and feel normal again. And so to me, that made sense to get to the root cause. And then, you know, fast forward, I decided to go back to school. This was now 15 years into my private practice. Decided to go back to school and become a naturopathic doctor so that I could really practice the full scope of functional medicine. And, um, and that was a very intensive program. So I'm in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. The school that I went to is in Chicago. So I moved back to Chicago for two years and I was flying back and forth to maintain my private practice. So I'm in class 30 hours a week, plus studying for exams and flying back and forth. And so, you know, when you have a goal in life, you just bite the bullet and you just get through it. I said, short-term pain for long-term gain. But that took a lot out of me. And I didn't realize until after I graduated, you know, I was tired after I graduated. I was mentally tired, I was physically tired. And I just thought, you know what? I'm just gonna take some time off, regroup, my energy will come back up and life will be great again. And uh, that didn't happen actually. And that's what I write about in my book that, and th this is true for a lot of health providers that our journey often become, starts with our own health. And so I wasn't getting any answers from the you know, medical establishment from my family doctor. And so I started treating myself and Technically, as a doctor, you should not be treating yourself. So I broke the rules there, but I wanted answers. And so I started implementing these things, you know, these strategies, looking for the root underlying causes. And so that's how this all kind of started and developed. And from there, I've learned that fatigue is super common. P you know, lots of people have issues with energy. They want to have more energy. 
And it's also something that within the medical establishment, I don't think is very well treated. So they'll look for something like, does this, does this patient have an, an anemia? Does this patient have a thyroid problem? You know, 90% of the time those tests come back normal, but the patient is still like, okay, I still feel tired. What, what do we do about that? And so they're not getting answers or the answers that they're getting or the advice that they're getting is something like, well, you just need a vacation or mm, maybe you're depressed. Let's try an antidepressant. You know, basically like it's in your head and those aren't, that's not realistic. Like there is a, fatigue is a symptom. There's a reason for it. So let's figure that out. And I've also learned that fatigue patients are, so it's very common, but it's also very complex. So not, no two fatigue patients are alike, just like snowflakes. No two snowflakes are alike. It's the same thing with fatigue patients. So it's also, it keeps me as a doctor, keeps me challenged all the time to try and understand each individual person and how to help them. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that, because one of my questions was definitely, um, you know, wanted to make sure that the people who were watching understood what uh, a functional medicine doctor is. So I appreciate that. And it seems like, you know, what you experienced and what led you to really be digging in to figure out what was going on for yourself is is absolutely in alignment for energy empowerment. And, and I, too, um, you know, that I was diagnosed with adrenal blowout a little over seven years ago. I had no idea what it was, thank goodness. I had a friend who uh, pushed me to go see her doctor who was an acupuncturist and trained Western doctor. And she was the one who figured it out. And But it was a long, lonely road. I didn't have this handbook during that time, you know. Uh, so I, I'm glad that we're here today to be able to talk about it. And, you know, we, let's sort of just go from a macro view for a moment. How how does energy, from, from your perspective and all of your training, how does energy or physical energy impact our clarity of thought and impact our ability to tap into our innate skill sets for performance and our overall health? So that's a great question. And I think energy is the vitality behind all of those things that you mentioned. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of research going on right now about brain health. There's a ton of research on gut health and brain health right now. And what they're finding as far as brain health concerned is what they're finding with brain health is that one of the first signs of trouble with your brain, I should say not sign, one of the first symptoms is fatigue. And the, the top three symptoms of inflammation of your brain or neural inflammation would be fatigue, um, cognitive issues, so difficulty with your short-term memory or searching for words, things like that. <clears throat> and uh, something like chronic pain in the body. And so fatigue can manifest in many different shapes and form. But as you were saying, if we don't have enough energy from a physiological perspective, so at the cellular level, so we have our body, our body is made of all these organs. We have, the organs are made of groups of tissues. The tissues are made of cells and inside the cells are tiny little organs as well. So you might remember some of this, your listeners and viewers might remember some of this from science class learning about the tiny organs inside the cell, the nucleus, the nucleolus, the ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the mitochondria. And so for energy, we're really looking at fundamentally, are the mitochondria healthy? Because it's their job to make energy in its purest form. And that drives then everything in the body. The hormones, the brain chemistry, you know, blood flow, having energy to do things, to enjoy life. And so I think energy is vital for, for all of these things that you said. Great. Thank you for that. You know, it, it seems, I, I'm really curious about 
you know, how has functional medicine and being a functional medicine doctor helped you get to these root causes in ways that, say, other doctors and other practices just aren't able to get to? It's not that they're smart enough. It's just, you know, training or philosophy or whatever the case may be. Can you explain to us a little bit how you're able to really dig in in ways that others can't? Oh, so that's another really good question. So depending on the type of health provider that you're talking about, if we're talking about a typical medical doctor, you, they're trained in such a way that they're looking at symptoms to try and figure out what the diagnosis is. And then from the list of medications, what pill do we give that? There's a pill for every ill, right? And in functional medicine, we're trained to really understand how the body works. So the pure physiology of the body, how does everything work? How does everything fit together? And how do things get connected? So they say that everything in the body is connected and it is. And they're showing that through the research that's being done now. Your brain is connected to your gut, your gut's connected to your brain, hormones, impact everything. We could go on and on and on about that. And so functional medicine doctors are really trained to understand how things are connected and to try and get to the root of it, to the root underlying cause. And we do that, so a lot of that we do through history, so a really comprehensive history. And then there are tests that we do, blood tests, stool tests, urine tests, to try and get to the root underlying cause to try and uh, support what we think are the issues and then treat accordingly. And treatment usually entails lifestyle changes, so diet, exercise, stress management, getting good sleep, all of that, and then targeted nutrients if it's using vitamins, if it's using herbs, um, when is appropriate to use medication. So in functional medicine, in my practice, I recommend medication when it's appropriate for the patient. And so that's kind of how functional medicine doctors are trained. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I think not everybody has that background to be able to, it's like figuring, it's really like figuring out a puzzle. Mm. It, it sounds like, you know, you're, you're truly uh, the Sherlock Holmes. Uh, functional medicine people are the Sherlock Holmes of, of our, our, our medicine doctors out there. It's true. It is true. And I, I'm curious uh, to, as well as, you know, again, I'm, my, my questions are not to disparage people who have different training. You know, uh, all, all the training is good and we, we need all of these doctors. How do you work with other doctors um, or other medical prof professionals? How do you interface when a client comes in and maybe they're stuck or they've gotten a recommendation from another doctor, how does that work? Oh, so that's a really good question too. So when I see a new patient and I would say that I practice very differently from the average practitioner out there, people need to apply to be my patient. So they, they actually fill out a full application that's two pages long and I'm getting an idea of what their health problem is, when did it start, what have they already tried, what tests have already been done, what doctors have they seen, to get an understanding of, is this patient appropriate for functional medicine? Is this patient appropriate for me, for my skill set? Um, and is this patient a good fit? I'm trying to find out those three things ahead of time. So patients actually fill out an application and then once your application is, if it's accepted, we have our first visit. Very often times these patients, at least that I see in my practice, they've already run the gamut of the medical establishment. So they've already seen their family doctor multiple times. They've usually seen one or two specialists. They've often already seen one or two naturopaths and now they're in my office and so we try and then just figure it out. And so when I have a case that I'm trying to co-manage, because 
there are cases where I have to send that patient back to the doctor and say, you know what, this patient, they need X, Y, and Z. Can you do that for them? Because I can't, it's not within my scope of practice. So as I can, when it's possible to try and create that, as you were saying earlier, like all these health providers, we all have a role to play and everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. I know what my strengths are and I know what my weaknesses are. And so ideally for the patient that they have a team to help them with their health, ideally that's what healthcare should be. And a big chunk of that is functional medicine, like getting to the root so that the patient doesn't just feel better. That's important that they feel better, but also that we're getting them to a whole other level of health. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Tia. Thank okay. you for that. I had <laughs> muted myself. <laughs> so here I am chatting away. I was like, um, I could read I could you read your lips for a little bit and then I was like, I can't do it. <laughs> we're, we're not we're not gonna be moving forward too quickly on that one. Um, thanks so much for explaining all of that. And I think you know, I'm I'm curious, uh, you know, I have lots of curiosities. Have you seen a shift in um, in the medical establishment, your your colleagues in different fields approaching their patients' healthcare in different ways. I I have this idea or this imagination that, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was your family practitioner, that's who you went to, and all of these, you know, other things, acupuncturists or, you know, this naturopathic thing, that was just like this alternative medicine over in the corner somewhere. Have you seen a, a shift from when you first started as a functional medicine doctor and, and, and a, natu a trained naturopathic doctor from where you started to where we are today in creating this this um, network of healthcare professionals. Absolutely. So I've been in practice now. I'm just going to say 20 plus years. <laughs> 20 plus years, and I would say really within the last 10 years, there's been a definite shift. And I don't necessarily think it's within the medical community, and I'll explain more about that. But I think it's more just awareness. Patients are becoming more aware. People are becoming more aware. And then absolutely within the last three to five years, with summits like what you're putting on, uh, people just posting videos, putting blog posts out there. Like I have my podcast, The Functional Medicine Radio Show. We just want to get all of this information out there so that people know there are alternatives out there. And I say about the medical community, I don't see a change within the medical community. Now, I'm in Canada. The medicine that's practiced in Canada is socialized medicine, so it was, it's all regulated by the government. And I would say within that uh, paradigm, I don't see much changing yet. And my hope is that someday it will. And I think as more and more people, patients, voice their opinions and tell their doctors what they're looking for, what they want, you know, ultimately they're going to start adding more training within medical school so that doctors can help patients and be more of an advocate for them. Wonderful. And, and I think, you know, you've led us down a, a path here to a question that is now really burning in my mind. Okay, great. Right. But, you know, I've got a lot on my plate. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an executive. I also have a family. And, uh, you know, we're running around and we're doing all kinds of things. You know, I just need another cup of coffee or, or whatever it is. How, in your book, you talk about like the eight, the eight key um, elements that, that are tied to fatigue. Could you walk us through those eight key aspects of fatigue and what are some of the signs so that our viewers can start taking a look and doing some self-evaluation so they've got the right questions to ask? Oh, sure, sure. So um, I only allotted eight in the book. There's way more than eight, but I had to like instead of making this huge book, okay, let's just streamline it to eight to start. 
So at the top of the list, and what should always be checked first for patients that are tired is to see if you do have an anemia. And oftentimes that has already been done and that has already been ruled out. And second to that, second on the list, which should absolutely always be done, as we talked about earlier, is to check the thyroid. Now, one of the things with the thyroid that I see in my practice is that the thyroid testing that's often run is the very basic screening test. And if that test comes back normal, then the patient is just deemed, well, you're, you're th you don't have a thyroid problem. And there are other tests that are more specific that we can dive deeper to figure out the thyroid, testing free T4, free T3 for antibodies. So I would say for the listeners out there and the viewers, when I'm suspicious that my patient might have a thyroid problem, I'll test their free T3. And if that free T3 is not in the upper end of the normal range, and they're having thyroid symptoms, so apart from feeling tired, um, oftentimes we see that uh, they're losing hair, the outer thirds of their eyebrows are getting thin, or they're gone, um, constipation, dry skin, feeling cold hands, cold feet, cold nose even. These are all very common signs of thyroid issues. And so if I see this in, in uh, the picture of what the patient's case is, I'm gonna be wondering, that patient probably has a thyroid issue. And then third on the list you were talking about earlier is adrenals and uh, cortisol imbalance. So cortisol is our, our main hormone that helps protect us from chronic stress. And so cortisol, I would say for the most part, for the patients that have come to see me, their cortisol is pretty much flatlined. Like, so cortisol ideally should be high in the morning when we first wake up. That's actually part of the physiology of why we wake up is there's a spike in cortisol. And then it slowly trickles down through the day and it should be lowest at night. And that helps allow us to get good deep sleep. So if you're having energy surges in the evening and you're tired in the morning, that could be a cortisol imbalance. If you're not sleeping well through the night, that could potentially be a cortisol imbalance. If you have weight gain, especially around your middle, that's typically a cortisol imbalance. And then fourth on the list is blood sugar imbalances. And a lot of this is, has to do with diet that if the blood sugar is too high or too low, that creates a stress in the body and can tap out your energy. And then fifth on the list is nutrient deficiencies. And this covers a wide range of things, but of course we wanna look for, does this patient have enough iron? Is their ferritin at 50 or higher? If it's not, that's a problem. What about their B12? I learned from my training with Dr. Dale Bredesen and that B12 ideally should be between 500 and 1500. Most patients they're not. Uh, vitamin D, vitamin D is hugely important for a whole variety of reasons. Um, patients in Canada usually have never had their vitamin D tested. And it's a, it, the odds are pretty good, like 90% especially living in Canada, that your vitamin D is not ideal. And then six on the list, we have chronic hidden infections. So this is where we're looking for chronic hidden infections in the body. Typically, the first place we look is the gut. So bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine, known as SIBO. Um, harmful forms of bacteria in the large intestine or parasites or yeast or fungal overgrowth. These infections, so we think about the gut first, but infections could be anywhere in the body. They could be, uh, as far as gingivitis is concerned, in the mouth, up in the sinus cavities. Infections will tap out your immune system. They will create stress in your body and add to more cortisol issues. Infections will, they typically secrete toxins and waste products and that will have an impact on inflammation in the body, on the brain. 
infections are very common and actually oftentimes that's where I'll start with a patient is running a simple stool test to see, okay, what's going on in your gut. And very oftentimes I see that patients have a probiotic deficiency and then they have something going on, uh, nasty bacteria or yeast overgrowth or a, a parasite. I would say nine times out of 10 when I do a stool test, at least let's say in my patient population, I find something significant. And then uh, number seven on the list is looking for hidden food allergies and sensitivities. So food allergies and particularly food sensitivities um, can be quite pervasive, but also quite tricky to figure out. So very often patients eat and people in general eat the same, you know, 10 to 12 foods day in and day out. And if there's one thing on that list that you have a sensitivity to, again, that's gonna contribute to inflammation in the body, that's gonna put more stress on your body. And then last on my list, at, at least for the book is concerned, is the brain. <laughs> and uh, I've actually been doing a lot more research and training and gaining more information on the brain in the last few years. So that whole part of the book should probably be rewritten, but there is a lot that can go on in the brain. And, and I find that most health providers look at the body like from the neck down. They don't really think about the brain and its impact on everything as well. And so when we think about brain and how that can impact fatigue, so like I said, we talked about issues with cognition. So searching for words or forgetting where you put something, walking into a room and forgetting why you, you know, walked in, going to the grocery store, having to pick up three items and only remembering, you know, two, things like that. And then, um, you know, from there, those are, that's, that's basically the list. And I, I don't know if there's any one of those areas that you want me to dive deeper. I know, cause we only have so much time. But um, those are the, the things that are on my plate when a patient, you know, especially a fatigued patient walks in that I'm like thinking, okay, what's going on? And it's usually not just one thing that's causing their fatigue. It's usually a bunch of things that need to be sorted out. Okay, so, you know, thank you. That list is incredibly, I mean, as you said, there's a lot, there are a number of other things that could be going on, but it's really a very complete list. And I know that in your book, you know, you really walk people through a lot of the details uh, of, of what they can ask about. Um, you know, they, there's, it's a step-by-step, -step, like when you go to see your doctor, here are some things that you can ask them to test for and whatnot. And I, I feel like there's, at least in the, within my community, there's still a lot of confusion between like hypothyroid and Hashimoto's and sleep right now is getting a lot of press because, you know, thanks to Ariana Huffington, one first in her book Thrive and now The Sleep Revolution. And so I'd love if you wouldn't mind maybe talking a little bit about Hashimoto's and thyroid a little deeper. And then uh, if you wouldn't mind also going into sleep and that way our, our viewers and listeners can walk away with, uh, you know, some, some hot tips on those, those two. Okay, no problem. And thanks for mentioning that about the book because I really tried to write it in a very simplified manner that anybody could understand. So it's not loaded with all these, you know, doctor terms. <laughs> so with the thyroid, and I particularly love talking about the thyroid because I have a thyroid issue myself. And it started when I went back to school, actually. So this is my story. So when I was halfway through my, you know, naturopathic degree, I, uh, I was back in Ontario and I went to see my family doctor, you know, for a checkup. And they said, uh, oh, your TSH is a little bit elevated. And I said, it is. Well, where, where am I at? And it was at seven point something. And at that time, the range was like 0 0.5 to five. And now I'm at a seven. I said, oh, I'm at a seven? Oh, that's not good. And the doctor said, oh, well, we don't do anything about that until it gets worse. Until you're in the double digits, we don't care about that unless you're having symptoms. And I said, well, gee, 
you didn't even, didn't even ask me if I was having symptoms. <laughs> so there are very obvious thyroid problems. So when we look for a, at the TSH value, a TSH above a two already has me suspicious that there might be something going on with the thyroid. And then as I was saying earlier, symptom-wise, cold hands, cold feet, hair loss or thinning of the hair, um, losing the outer third of your eyebrows, constipation, dry skin, these are like all, and weight gain, these are all classic thyroid issues. The most common, um, the most common diagnosis of thyroid is uh, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So that means it's your your own immune system is attacking your thyroid and slowly destroying that. So that's easily diagnosed with, uh, there's two blood tests, uh, thyroperoxidase antibody or TPO antibody. And then the other one is a thyroglobulin anti antibody or TG antibody. These are easy tests that are run by all labs. They're standard. And if either of those tests come back with elevated antibodies, you have Hashimoto's, which like I said is, and it, it's your immune system that's attacking your thyroid. So that's a whole other ball game as to, well, why is your immune system misbehaving and what do we need to do to get your immune system to behave more normally again and stop that attack? Because Hashimoto's is the number one leading cause of hypothyroidism, unfortunately, most patients that have hypothyroidism are not diagnosed with Hashimoto's until years and years later. So this whole process usually, it usually is going on for five to 10 to 15 years, slowly destroying your thyroid until your TSH um, starts to come up. So that's typically what we see. And then when we talk about the more specialized tests, like I said, the free T3. So I, I have seen plenty of times the TSH looks beautiful, the free T4 looks beautiful, but the free T3 looks awful. It's on the low end of the normal range or it's low, below normal range. And so T3 is the most active of the thyroid hormones in your body. That's, T3 is what gets the job done. And so if T3 is low or on the low end of normal, I'm, I know that that needs to be worked on. Every single cell in the body has receptors for thyroid hormones. So we wanna push thyroid hormones to the periphery, to your fingertips, to your toes, all through your brain, to every cell of your body. That's thyroid. Is there anything else you wanna know about thyroid before we talk about sleep? <laughs> No, I, th I think that's really, really helpful. And unless you feel like there's anything to mention about uh, hyperthyroid uh, issues and, and the tie-in to, you know, how that also impacts our body and make, gets us out of balance. Okay. So hyperthyroid. So the most common cause of hyperthyroid is also an autoimmune attack. It's just attacking different parts of your thyroid. Uh, so that's called Graves' disease. And that can be diagnosed with different antibody tests. Um, patients that have hyperthyroid, typically things get speeded up in the body. So we often see um, racing heart or, or feeling your heart pounding in your chest. Um, instead of constipation, we start seeing more diarrhea. Instead of fatigue, we start seeing more anxiety and feeling like wired, you're, like you're on too much caffeine. Okay. And instead of weight gain, we start seeing weight loss. Mm -hmm. So that with that kind of a picture, we, we're, we're suspicious of hyperthyroidism. And actually, hyperthyroidism is very easy to diagnose. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, we can, we can dig right into sleep now if, sleep. if we'd like. Yes. My I'm favorite. So, I'm so happy that there's more information coming out about sleep. And, um, I shot a video, oh, so many years ago, just talking about how using a simple, you know, eye mask while you sleep makes such a huge difference. So I think I should say, I shouldn't think. Every patient that comes to see me that has fatigue, I want to know how well they're sleeping, 
How well do you fall asleep? How well do you stay asleep? And do you get good sleep, deep sleep? Do you snore? Things like that. So trying to figure out, are they getting enough sleep? And if not, of course, that's going to be part of the whole fatigue puzzle. And so if patients have a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep, this could be related to blood sugar imbalances. This could be related to cortisol issues. This could be related to, especially for women, for women who have a hard time staying asleep. Maybe, you know, they sleep until two in the morning or three in the morning or four in the morning, they wake up and then they have difficulties falling back to sleep. That's very often a progesterone issue. And by simply giving them, so we talked earlier about, I, functional medicine doctors, we do believe in the benefit of medication as long as it's appropriate, used appropriately. And so when I have a female patient that has fatigue and they have a hard time staying asleep, the thing that goes to the top of my list is, oh, I wonder what's going on with her progesterone. Because how to fix that is so easy. Give them pet progesterone, they sleep like a baby. And then, like I said, up ab uh, above and beyond that, very simply using an eye mask to help block the extraneous sources of light that we have. So the light that creeps in around your window blinds, your window shades, the light that comes off of your whatever electronic gadgets you have in your bedroom, the light from your alarm clock, all of that actually disrupts your sleep. You know, before we had all of this great technology, before we had electricity, we slept in the dark, <laughs> right? It was dark. And so we want to try and mimic that in our bedrooms. And the cheapest, easiest way to do that is to wear an eye mask. I can't tell you how many patients that I'd say, like, just go over to, in Canada, we have um, a store called Winners. In the US, the equivalent is Marshalls. Like, just go over there and buy an eye mask. It looks like a, you know, I've had patients call it a, a mini training bra for your eyes because it has like these molded cups. It's very comfortable. And, uh, you know, 10 bucks. You can't, you can't beat that. And to start wearing that every night, that nine times out of 10 patients will tell me that they can tell that that's helping because they get deeper sleep. They feel more rested when they wake up in the morning. So many people are in sleep debt and so I'm glad that they're doing more research on this. Me too. You know, it's it's one of the things that when I work with my clients and and I wonder if you do the same, have the same kind of conversation as well as really talking about <clears throat> the period just before they start to go to bed. You know, we do it with people who are uh, parents or I think we can even remember being, you know, when we were young, I know that my parents were like, let's read a book or it's time to stop playing or we need to we need to pick up our toys and put them away yeah, and there's a whole routine yes and making a ceremony around it and sort of this power down hours is that something that you also talk with your clients about absolutely um we talk about trying to limit electronics and if you do use electronics to have those the, the screen changes the flux program, it changes the brightness of the screen, the, instead of it being blue light that comes out, it's more red light. Okay. Imagining like the sun is going down, there's more red in the sky. Um, that, that helps the brain start producing better amounts of melatonin. <clears throat> and um, things like you know, when do you exercise during the day? Don't exercise in the evening. <laughs> I know most people, that's when they have time to exercise, but really that's not good for sleep. And we talk about using alcohol. Um, but yeah, as you were saying, creating a, a new ritual or routine, if it's doing some journaling, if it's just simply taking a moment to practice some gratitude, to think about, okay, what are three things I'm really grateful for today? It happened today. Doesn't have to be anything big. It just could be something small like, I, I'm glad that that guy, I don't know who he was, but he waved me into my lane. It could be something simple like that. And then 
you know, for some patients, if they want to incorporate some aromatherapy, you know, some lavender oil, some soothing music. I mean, there's so many different things and, and it's really tricky just trying to figure out what is the patient willing to do on a consistent basis and what works for them, you know, so that they do start getting a better sleep routine and then they start reaping the rewards of that. Wonderful. Yeah, you know, just uh, have a bedtime story. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's okay. You know, go go get your, you know, go get a new child's book that, or maybe your favorite one from childhood. <laughs> Put that by yeah. your bed on your, yeah. uh, you know, read that every night. Uh, well, well, thank you for that. I can really see how, you know, patients coming to you who are feeling just stuck and lost and frustrated can really find some immediate answers and, and simple things that they can really implement the moment they walk out of your office to affect real change in their life, uh, to, to get this energy in balance. I guess that's the, the big thing is that people that are struggling with energy, that are struggling with fatigue, they should have a lot of hope that there are answers out there. Like I said at the top of our interview, it can be really complicated. There are no two, two fatigue patients that are alike, just like no two snowflakes are alike. Um, but there, there is a, a reason that that's happening and to keep digging for it. So when I'm working with a patient and we're, we're starting to treatment, I say, you know, within the next three months, you, there should be a noticeable difference, okay? We're doing this treatment for your gut or for your hormones or for whatever it is. You should notice a remarked difference uh, in the next three months. And if you don't, if you don't notice a change within the first three months, we're missing something. So we have to dig deeper and see, well, what are we missing? Start treating that. Okay, now timer starts again. We should see a change within these three months. We do great. We don't. We're missing something. We still have to dig deeper. So I tell patients, if we have to dig all the way to China, I'm willing to do that for you. So for your viewers and your listeners out there to have hope that something can be done about it. And, and I think that the golden nugget, you know, as the phrase is, is like in three months, if you're not seeing a change, something else, you haven't quite found the solution. And, and it sounds like, and in, our, and in your book, you know, you allude to this and say, like, just keep asking questions. And again, you know, here it is, like, it is step by step and gives you all of these great things that you can you can take to your doctor and work with your doctor on. You know, if you don't have somebody in your community that is a functional medicine doctor uh, or you can't find a naturopathic doctor, this book is great so that you can you can take some notes with you and work with your doctor and invite your doctor to work uh, as a team to figuring out the solution to your energy crisis. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I like to I like to ask patients, how would you rate your energy from zero to ten? Zero is no energy at all. Ten is your batteries are on full charge. So you, the viewer right now, you, the listener, where would you rate your energy from zero to ten? Zero is none at all. Ten is your batteries are on full charge. And I would say if you're not consistent consistently at eight and higher, that you are suffering from some level of low energy and fatigue and that that will be impacting the different areas of your life. I would say the most, one of the things that I've learned in practice of the many things, like I said, I've been in practice now 20 plus years. My personally, my energy has ebbed and flowed. I am not perfect with my diet. I'm not perfect with my lifestyle. I try as hard as I can. Sometimes I'm better, sometimes I'm worse, but I find that one of the biggest things that we can do to have an impact on our energy is really to make sure we're eating a good diet and that we don't, re I, I think most of us don't realize how bad we are until we start feeling good again. And we look back and we say, holy cow, was I bad? <laughs> yeah. I absolutely agree. You know, I think back to this, you know, that seven years ago and that Cause month. Because you, you, 
you medicate with ca caffeine and sugar and caffeine and sugar. Yeah. And pushing through and I have clients that need attention and I have deadlines and, you know, I had my own business and it was, I was in rock and roll for tw over 20 years. So uh, on the road and pushing through and on the phone and on the computer and direct messaging and texting and, you know, that was the lifestyle and uh, it, you know, it laid me out flat for sure. And, and I look back and I'm like, I've ignored a lot of signs for sure until until my body came knocking in a way that you know I had to listen and so you know now that I share that story you know I wonder if if I had stumbled into someone like you and and if I had protested you know she doth protest too much right um, <laughs> you know uh, Dr. Carey I'm, I'm too busy I'm too busy I have too much going on I have you know I have my career I have a business to run I have board meetings you know I've got my kids you know my, my family relies on me when that conversation comes up amongst your patients or colleagues what do you tell those women to help them get unstuck from that story and help them move out of dis-ease into a healthful life so that's a great question and probably the hardest to answer. <laughs> um, I think everybody has their tipping point where they say, like me personally, this is enough. I, now I do need to do something about it, even though I'm busy, even though I don't have you know time to exercise, even though blah, blah, blah. Everybody has that tipping point, but it's hard for the people that are not quite there yet. Um, to get them to see how important this really is and that if they had more energy and vitality that they could then give more to their loved ones, to their friends, family, to their job, to their career. It all starts with you. And in a very practical manner too, just one step forward is going in the right direction so to just take it step by step bit by bit so for I would say I'll tell you a personal story for me I've never been a fan of exercise I really don't like exercise um, so there were years and years that got you know went by that the only exercise that I did was walking my dog and it, that was a good 45 minute to an hour walk every day but that's pretty much all I did and um, I know what drives me is, especially when it comes to exercise, is I need to commit to something. And I think a lot of people are like this. I need to make a commitment, and that means a financial commitment. So I, I found a gym. I signed up for the membership, slapped my credit card down. Okay, I put the money down, and I'm not going to lose that money. And so that drives me then to go to go to get the most uh, bang for my buck. I think a lot of people are actually like that. And that if you can do something like that, that can help drive you and help keep you accountable. Some people, they need a buddy to work with, a friend, a colleague to help keep them accountable. But really in the grand scheme of things, just if you can take one step in the right direction, no matter how small it is, but just keep at it. Small steps, small steps. When I did, I did a podcast interview with Dr. Tom O'Brien, and he said, it's not home runs that win the baseball game. It's base hits. We just want to get a base hit here. So just like a, a little step moving forward, that's good. And just keep, keep at it. I love that analogy. You know, it's, we just need to get to first base. Let's get to first base, make our way yeah. to second base. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not about, um, unless, you know, something's obviously critically wrong. I defer to you that's on all, that. That's a different story. But right. yeah, even with diet changes, does anybody really want to change their diet? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I know for me personally what worked, and, and I talk about this in the book, is that, you know what, I just started – modifying breakfast the rest of it like I could care less but I started modifying breakfast how do I make my breakfast more healthy gluten-free grain-free things like that 
it took me a couple of weeks to find the recipes that I liked, to find uh, breakfast, you know, two or three that I could choose from, something that was also fast and convenient. But hey, after two or three weeks, I mastered breakfast. Okay, now let's work on lunch. Okay, what do I need to tweak with my lunch to make it more healthy? And you just make those modifications. And before you know it, your diet has changed. Wonderful. And, and the last thing I'll say about that, sorry, Tia, is that I know for me personally, as I've made diet changes, when I've gotten through it, you know, and I'm on the other side, I realize, well, you know, that that wasn't too bad. That wasn't as hard as I thought it was would be. Like what's, a lot of it is our mental barriers that I, I can't, I don't have enough time, it's going to hurt too much, it's going to be taste terrible, it's going to be so expensive. It's a lot of mental stuff. A lot of I can't, I can't, I can't. But once you get through it and you look back, it's like, what, what was I stressing about? That wasn't too bad. And you know what? I actually feel better. I could go back to that diet and feel crappy again, or I could stay here. Is it more work? A little bit more work. Yeah. But I feel good at this. Great. I think, you know, again, it's, it's just a little bit of a recap, you know, making a financial commitment. That's a big one for a lot of us. Accountability partners, um, not, not focusing on hitting the grand slam, even though if we want to just make it to, to first base. So thank you for those, those hints. And, you know, my next question was going to be, geez, Dr. Carey, what are your top tools uh, for women to double their energy? and uh, really hone in on clarity and peak performance and optimum health. And I know you've given us a lot of hints throughout you know, this entire interview, but are there uh, some last few things that you'd like to make sure that we really highlight as we, as we close up and, and move into talking about these wonderful, generous free gifts you have for everyone? So I guess there is, there's, I don't have a great answer for that question. It's really what the patient is willing to change at that moment in time. Because like I said, it, you, you have to work on, are you eating healthy? Are you exercising? Are you meditating or practicing some form of relaxation? Are you getting a vitamin R, you know, uh, re recreation? Um, getting good deep sleep at night, like those basic things before we even delve into thyroid issues or hidden infections in the gut or food sensitivities or whatever, um, I think it's really, it is highly dependent on the patient in front of me and what are they willing to do. So you know what? I ask them, I think you need to do X, Y, and Z. Where do you want to start? Oh, Dr. Kier, I definitely, I don't have time to work on my diet right now. But I could start exercising more. Okay, wonderful. What do you think that you could do? Well, I could go. I could walk the dog. Great. And where are you going to walk the dog? And how long are you going to walk the dog? And how many days a week are you? And so we just like, like I said, it depends on the patient. There's no wrong answer. There's no wrong answer to any of this. It's just where are they willing to to start on the process and then down the line when they're feeling better or when they have more flexibility within their schedule or whatever we start tackling those other things so that's how i approach it it's very much a team effort at least in my office to say here are your options this is what i think is going on where do you want to start wonderful and you know a lot of a lot of the times I say, you know, we are unique beings and everyone has a unique body. And you've just really highlighted that for everyone, that what works for you or what works for me may not be the best path for another person. So it is really, you know, in what I'm gathering from all of these great tips that you've shared with us, it's really about what each unique person can bring to the table and and how 
um, they can move through the variety of steps and the changes that they can make for themselves. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, thank you for all of this amazing information. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear a little bit more about these amazing gifts that you have for everyone who has registered to uh, for the Energy Empowerment Masterclass. So as my gift to your view viewers and listeners, um, they could also get a copy of the book, Reclaim Your Energy and Feel Normal Again. Oh. Um, so we're going to be getting you the link for that. Uh, we just asked that you pay the shipping and handling, otherwise it's free. And then with that, you'll also get, um, I think it's three videos. Um, one, one video I talk about the eye mask. We already kind of talked about that. Um, one video I talk about um, the smoothie that made a huge difference in my, my energy. And you know what, the third video, I don't even remember what that's about. Uh, ultimate, uh, most common causes of fatigue for folks with certain medical histories. So probably in that we're going through some of these, um, some of these eight factors that we talked about in more detail. It's, I'm sorry, it's been a while since I shot those and, and I don't remember what's on that one. It's good. That's okay. <laughs> you know what? They, they're amazing. Uh, and and then there's also the the ebook, um, five quick and e five quick easy ways to help with your with your memory. Yeah, my memory sucks. That's what I I there hear everybody go. saying. My memory sucks. So that's the title of it. My memory sucks. Yeah, because there it's actually um, becoming more and more common that people have issues with fatigue and their brain and memory. And so, yeah, I put together that free ebook to talk about that. And again, like, what are the, what are the simple things that might be causing that? And what are some of the simple things that you can do to help make your brain a little bit stronger? Wonderful. Thank you. So everyone, uh, the links were sent in the email with this, the link to this video, plus the links are below this video. These very generous gifts. Uh, again, I'll hold it up because I, I love this book, <laughs> Reclaim Your Energy. Thanks, yeah. You know, um, it, it has been so helpful for me. And I know that if you don't already have it, it will be so helpful for you as well. So you'll get this book, you'll get um, the ebook, My Memory Sucks, and three videos to help walk you through solutions. And Dr. Carey, what an honor. And I so appreciate you joining the Energy Empowerment Movement and uh, for taking the time to talk with us all today. Oh, Tia, you're welcome, and thank you for having me on, and and thank you for creating this movement to help spread the word and help get this information out there. My pleasure, my pleasure.